Thank you so much, and good evening. It is a, uh, it is a true joy and, and honor to be here. To, uh, Josh, thank you. Uh, you are not just a friend. Uh, you are a mensch. You are a guide. You are not just kind, but your kindness spreads. And it's incredibly meaningful to, uh, to be introduced by you and to be here with your family as well. So God bless you, and thank you so much. Uh, to the entire uh, associated, uh, I uh, say on behalf of the entire city of Baltimore, on behalf of Israel, and by, on behalf of the entire diaspora, Toda Raba. <laughs> and, and I say thank you because your work has not just been meaningful, it's been noticed. It's been life-saving, and it's been life-altering. To, uh, you know, to uh, you know, my friends, uh, Debs and, and, and Mark, you know, one thing I believe in deeply is that organizations aren't just powerful on their own. They need leaders, and they need leadership to help get them there. And you can look at the power of what's taking place here at the Associated and what's been done, not just here in Baltimore, not just in Israel, but throughout the entire diaspora and know how powerful the impacts of this organization is. You know, I, um, I'm a very data-driven person. And, uh, and when you look at the data, because I've done my homework, and you look at the data and there are, you know, around 150 federations in, throughout North America. And if you look at the both quantitative and qualitative data that shows how the federations are doing, uh, Baltimore is right there at the very top. That doesn't happen by accident, right? That's, that just doesn't take place because. It takes place because of will. It takes place because of forethought. It takes place because of determination. And it takes place because this is an organization that finds a way of taking your greatest talents and matching it with the world's greatest needs and saying that we're here to help. I thank you for what you do for this city, for my city. You know, when, uh, when my wife and I first moved back to Baltimore about eight years ago, um, I remember first having a conversation with people who had been like lifelong friends. And I first told them, I was like, hey guys, guess what? I'm coming back to Baltimore. And kind of the collective response for many of them could be summed up in one word, and they're like, why? <laughs> What's going on? They're like, is mom okay? I'm like, mom's fine. Everything okay at work? Everything's great at work. So why? And my answer actually is, is, is pretty simple in the fact that, that this is my community. This is my home. You know, the beautiful thing about this place that we all call home right now, and, um, and, and if you tell all my friends at Robin Hood that I say this, I'll deny it. <laughs> but we know there are certain things and certain, certain instances when it comes to other cities where those cities just keep on churning, right? where their stories are very much, they've been written in many ways, and people continue to be part of that process. But we live in a story, we live in a city whose story is being written as we speak. We live in a city that right now, we have the power, hi guys. That's my family, by the way, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm coming late. That's my wife, Dawn, and our daughter, Mia, and our son, James. So, hi, guys. I'm not going to start from the beginning. Y'all ain't missed much, though. <laughs> but we, we live in a city right now that is very proud to say, and we live in, a, in an area and a jurisdiction. And by the way, when I say city, I'm not just talking Baltimore City. I'm talking Baltimore County. We are a collective, right? We are a collective. And we live in a place right now where each and every one of us have our hands on the pen. Every one of us have our hands on the pen, and we are the authors of the next chapter 
of Baltimore. And it's something that this organization takes very seriously and has taken very seriously for a very long time. Whether we're talking about someone who is about to lose their home, whether we're talking about someone who hasn't eaten, whether we're talking about a child who needs to go to a school that feels better supported, you've been there. You've made it your responsibility. Because the truth is, it has been. And when we think about the collective place and the collective space that we are in right now, I think there's a couple really important things to remember. You know, one is that we have seen progress throughout. I can tell you right now, when I first, uh, and, and my, my wife is actually from, from New York, and so I always say when we brought her back to Baltimore, I felt like I had to kidnap her. <laughs> but I actually didn't, she loves this place. But when we first came back, I was like, listen, I'm gonna take her away from her hometown to bring her back to my hometown. So at a bare minimum, at a bare minimum, we'll let her pick the neighborhood, we'll let her pick the house, and you know, happy wife, happy life, right? <laughs> and I remember she calls me up uh, one day, and I was sitting at work, and she says, I think I found it. And I said, what? She said, I think I found the house. So I was like, all right, send me the link. So she sends me the link, and I click on it, and before I could, could even start looking through it, one of the first questions I asked was, I said, what neighborhood is it in? And she says, Guilford. Yeah. <laughs> you know. For those who don't know the history of Guilford, <laughs> not a one of us were welcome there. <laughs> right? Legally, not a one of us were welcome there. We weren't supposed to live there. We weren't supposed to live there. We definitely weren't supposed to buy property there. And I remember when she said the word Guilford, I felt like, and I, and, and she, and I, and I told her this, I felt like I became a 12-year-old kid again whose mom was telling me, don't go there. Because you won't be welcome. We live in Guilford now, and I feel pretty welcomed. But we can't forget that didn't happen by accident either. The reason we went from literally having a deed that said no blacks and no Jews to now being in an inclusive community did not happen just because of time. It happened because of will. It happened because of push. Progress does not happen by accident. Progress does not happen because, you know, we'll just close our eyes and we'll wake up better in the morning. Progress happens because we make it happen. Progress happens because we're aggressive about it. Progress happens because we don't believe in a plan B. That's what you've done throughout your entire career. That's what you've done throughout this entire process. And I think it's a really powerful time as you all are, are, are getting ready to, to celebrate the centenary and, and celebrate 100 years. And by the way, 100 years of service, I think, deserves a round of applause. Because when you come up to moments like this and you come up to times when we can come up to, to literally your centenary that you're getting ready for, it's like this actually is an important and, an, and a powerful time to take a beat. And to think about not just what we've accomplished, but also collectively what all still we have to get done together. Because the truth is, I thank God that right now, many of the battles that you have had to fight over the past 100 years, many of them, you no longer have to fight. And that's powerful, and we thank you for that. But the truth is, there are certain battles that remain amazingly stubborn. There are certain things that we thought we had beat that out of nowhere turn around and they are right back in your face again, and many times bigger and uglier than ever. 
Many times things that we thought would never have to be an issue in our children's lives, we know that we are now looking at a future where they might have to be present in our grandchildren's. Now, at that point, when you take that moment of reflection, you have two options, right? One, you could turn around and say, this is too hard. It's too difficult. We can't beat this. And we can curl up in a fetal position and then let the universe have their way with us. Or we can take the alternative. We can stand around and say, I can't believe those things that we were fighting before. I can't believe that they aren't dead yet. And it's too hard and we can't beat it. Or we can take the alternative. And we can stand up and we can stick our chests out. And we can say all those enemies and all those things and all that ugliness that's been lurking in the crevices that's been hiding in the caves and showing themselves in really ugly ways. Many of which, by the way, when I think about our community, the black community and the Jewish community, many of those things happen to look frighteningly similar. Many of those things might even have different names, but in many ways they are exactly the same thing, whether we are talking about anti-Semitism or racism. whether we are talking about sexism or xenophobia. At their core, they come down to one word, and that's hate. And we can turn around, and we can sulk, and we can say, I can't believe they're not dead, or we can stick our chest out and smile at the fact that somewhere, somewhere, all those ugly forces are getting together and they're frustrated and they're looking at us and saying, I can't believe they're not dead yet. (laughs) They're still here. They're not going anywhere. Because love will win. Love will conquer. We watch a progress that we have made as a collective community, and we can be proud of that progress, but we can never be satisfied because we know that as long as there are things to fight, we will be there to fight them. As long as there are troubles that have to be overcome, we will be there to overcome them. That's the collective commitment that the Associated has made. That's the impact that it has made on Baltimore and on Israel and on the diaspora. And that's the collective partnership that we've all done together, whether it was black and Jewish soldiers who were fighting side by side in World War II, or whether it was black and Jewish rabbis and ministers who were marching down south, whether it was black and Jewish students who made their way down for their freedom rides, or whether it was black and Jewish students who made their way down to Charlottesville. We stand united because that common enemy cannot overtake our common bond. You know, the reason that I had to come back to Baltimore is uh, because, as Josh said, my family moved us up to New York when I was younger. And my mom moved us up to New York after my father passed away. And my mother then started going through this process trying to figure out what in the world is going on with my son. You know, I saw saw my friend friend Joe Jones uh, here. And, uh, and, you know, we're talking about so many of the the, the young men um, that he works with all the time. And I look at him like, yep. I said, and I I I understand because I was like, Joe, that was me, man. So I get it. And my mother was trying to figure out and try different schools and try different places and trying to figure out what was going on around the fact that she was like, I found I had myself and I had a son who almost repeatedly and consistently was just finding himself getting more and more lost. 
where by the time I was literally nine years old, I was picking and choosing which days were worthwhile to go to school and which ones weren't. By the time I was 11 years old was the first time that I felt handcuffs on my wrists. And I found myself consistently hurting people that actually loved me so I could impress people that could care less about me. My mom tried different schools, and in fact, she sent me to one school that I get kicked out of. And true story, three years ago, they asked me to be their graduation speaker, <laughs> which, which I thought was hilarious, actually. So their dean called me up, and he's like, Wes, um, we'd like for you to be our graduation speaker. And I was kind of silent. And he was like, hello? I was like, oh, I'm still here. I said, you do know that it didn't work out that well for, for me or for you. And, and, uh, and his response was, he said, yeah, he said, we've, uh, we've just about fixed all the damage that you caused while you were here. So we decided it's time to invite you back. So uh, I went back. And, um, and then it was interesting because I, my mom was trying all these different things to try to figure out what was going on, what can help. And then eventually she ended up sending me off to a, a, a military school. And, and for those who have you know, background in my story, I went to military school when I was 13. I tried to run away five times in the first four days of this military school. I couldn't stand any bit of it when I first showed up there. Um, and in fact, the second last time I tried to run away, they actually drew me a map on how to get to the train station. <laughs> because it was so pathetic that I kept on getting lost. Um, <laughs> the map actually turned out to be fake. They, it, the map literally took me to the middle of the woods and they followed me laughing the whole time with like a flashlight doing this. They just wanted to see how bad I wanted to get home. But, but the, <laughs> and they saw, no, he really wants to go home. But the interesting thing is I think sometimes when people will take a look at that story there's an initial takeaway that they'll take from that story. And the initial takeaway they'll take from that story is, well, isn't it great that you got sent away? Because they'll say, you know, it was during that time that there started to be a transformation, and isn't it great that you got moved around, and all this kind of stuff. And my honest answer to them is this, is I'll always say, and I'll say, I'll say to my last days, some of the proudest moments in my life have not been when I was wearing a suit or wearing jeans or whatever. It was when I was wearing the uniform of this country, and I will always feel that way. But I know this. What happened to me wasn't the fact that I got picked up and moved around. What happened to me wasn't the fact that I got physically transported. What happened to me wasn't the fact that I kept on changing where I lived. What happened to me was I found myself surrounded by people. And starting with my mom and my grandparents, but eventually going to this remarkable string of teachers and principals and guidance counselors and mentors and friends and coaches and clergy. People who helped me to understand that the world was bigger than what was just directly in front of me. People who through their time and their gifts and their talent helped me to understand that the world was bigger than what was just directly in front of me. People who in essence taught me what it meant to be free. Because at its core fundamentally, that's our job. The work of the Associated is not just simply about how do we support housing or food, shelter or education. In essence, the, word of the, the, the work of the Associated comes down to one word, and that word is freedom. A freedom to know that you can move 
with a level of independence, a freedom to know that there is no reason nor justification nor tolerance for persecution, for insecurity, for fear. A freedom to know that your dreams should be supported by someone other than you. And a freedom to know who you are or where you live or who you worship should not ever be something that you have to be ashamed of or cower from. To know that everywhere you go, everywhere you walk on this planet, you are protected and you are protected by a shield called God's love. And that everywhere you walk here, you should feel at home because you are. The power of the work, the power of what you do, the freedom that you instill is the fact that every single person knows that even in the moment when they feel most alone, that they are not. Even in the moment when they feel most at pain, you're there to ease it. Even at the moment when they feel most, most separated, that's when you get closer. The power of freedom. The ability to know that someone out there, whether you know their name or not, someone out there you are fighting for and you are supporting, even if you never know their name, even if you never see their face, you will fight for them and you will support them because you believe in the hope of them. And you believe in the hope of their promise. That your job is to stand up and be, in the words of the great 20th century philosopher, Mr. Rogers. <laughs> your job is to be the helpers. When Mr. Rogers used to talk about how his mother told him that when you're hurt, or when you're scared, look for the helpers, because they're always there. For 100 years, you have been the helpers. For those who are hurt, for those who are scared, for those who are hungry, for those in an instant who have lost everything. You've been the helpers. And that's why you matter. That's why this organization matters. Because our job is to show people that no matter where you are, when you are feeling hurt and scared, look for the helpers, and you do it on a faith that the helpers will always be there. And our job is to make sure that the helpers are always there. I'm the, uh, the grandson of a minister, and I would like to leave you all with two things. One is a prayer and the other's a commitment. First, the prayer, and if you will all so indulge me, um, if we could all join hands. And I say this because, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the beautiful things, I had the, I had the uh, I'll say, if y'all wanna let go of hands right now real quick, because I'm gonna say one more thing, and then you can join hands again. <laughs> I, uh, I, had, I had the joy of, uh, of uh, with, with my, uh, uh, my friends, um, uh, Rachel and Rowe and the Weinberg Foundation. Uh, and it was funny because when I was, when I was checking, when I was checking the data, I was like, I'm looking at these numbers, and I was like, over 150 federations, this, this, is, this is serious, Baltimore's at the very top. And I was like, I called up Rachel, and I called up my friend Daryl Freeman, and I was like, are these numbers real? And they're like, oh yeah, those are real, those are real. 
But I remember I had the, the first chance I got a chance to go to, to Israel was with, uh, was with Rachel and, uh, and my friends from the Weinberg Foundation. And it's a trip I will absolutely never forget. And um, one of the beautiful things that I, that I, that I saw there, and, and we spent time, we spent over a week going from the north to the south, spending time with military officers and philanthropists. Um, and it's one of those trips that, to be very honest, has shaped and colored the way I both think about my work and has shaped and colored the way I think about the world. And um, we were talking about this reality of our larger interconnectedness, about the fact that uh, you know, whether you take time to pause and remember and break bread and celebrate on Friday evening or whether you, time to take, you have to take your time to take pause and remember and celebrate on a Sunday afternoon, that that's something collectively we all do because we all understand that we respond and we move under the orders of a most high. And so I say that as I now ask you to rejoin your hands. <laughs> and my prayer. My prayer is that God watch over the associated. My prayer is that God watch over your families, that God watch over your friends, that God watch over your hearts and your spirits and your souls because he speaks through them. That God watch over you because our goal and our request and our prayer is that the next hundred years you don't have to fight as many dragons as you did for the first hundred. And that you do it but you do it knowing why you do it. And if you don't do it, nobody else will. I pray that God give you the strength and the courage to keep fighting even when others stop. I pray that God continue to give you time to rest and reflect and, and, and reflect and be at peace. And I pray that God one day doesn't just continue to give you that reason to push, but also continues to reassure you that victory is on its way. And my commitment to you all is this. I'll be with you the entire way. We'll all be with you the entire way. God bless you, and thank you so much.